Um, I'm Greg Cross. I'm Chief Business Officer for Soul Machines. Um, so this is my friend Rachel. Um, she's a digital human. She's brought to life using our technology. Um, and so I'm going to um, start off. She's going to start off actually by um, by introducing me. I I'm hoping the sound is working here. Okay. Hi, Greg. Great to see you today. Hi, Rachel. How are you? Okay. Do you need me to tell everyone your life story? Sure. You're here to introduce me, so it probably would help if you can do that right now. The short version or the long version? I'm hoping for the short version myself. Well, I always hate for you to get bored introducing me, so let's stick with it short and sweet today, please. Okay. Greg is a Kiwi and Chief Business Officer for Soul Machines. Partnering with Dr. Mark Sager, the inventor of Baby X and the world's first virtual nervous system. So, um, so that's that's me. Um, this is Rachel. Um, so Rachel is a digital human. So most people tend to think of us as a company that builds avatars or digital humans. But um, it's not so much the digital humans which are incredible, but it's the technology that sits behind these digital humans which makes. Um, Rachel, incredibly special, because you can see her there responding to what she's seeing via my webcam and what she's hearing via my mic. So, you know, she's, you know, if I move over here, she's going to, you know, look over here for me. Um, if I smile, she's going to smile back. Um, so um, she's emotionally responsive. If I, you know, if she can't quite see my face and, and because my face is moving around a bit and it's a little bit dark in here, if she's struggle, struggling to pick up my face, um, her expressions might, you know, she might look a little confused at times. But what sits behind um, Rachel is a digital nervous system. So the incredible technology that my research team have created over the last seven years is the world's first virtual ner nervous system. So Rachel is built on top of neural networks, machine learning, and you know, quite uniquely biologically inspired models of different parts of the human brain. So you think about that for a second, and you know, I'll use a very, very simple example here. So I'm standing here, I smile at you, um, and you, you know, people here smiling back at me straight away. So what's actually happened there? So your eyes, your visual system has seen me smiling. Your brain has said, Greg's, you know, the person who's looking at me is smiling, so what should I do? And the brain says, well, that actually makes me feel good. It releases dopamine into your brain. It makes you feel good, and you smile back. All of that happens in a, I don't know, millisecond of a nanosecond or something like that. I'm not a neuroscientist. We have plenty of those on, on our team. So, so what we've actually created here is a virtual nervous system which enables Rachel, a digital human, to respond in exactly the same emotional way that we respond and we engage as human beings. So, um, so here's you know Rachel's. This is her digital brain and a representation of it. So, so you just seen red. Um, I've just given her a fright, and that's her virtual noradrenaline system kicking in, saying, "I'm now on alert. What's going to happen next? What's this crazy person going to do to me next?" Um, and that's exactly what happens to us when we get a fright. I mean, our, blood, our, our brain floods with noradrenaline and our alert systems are, are wary. Put, put, it puts us on full alert. And if we're stressed, it's cortisol. Um, so there's all of these neuro, neurotransmitters or chemical systems that feed our brain and make us respond and engage in the emo and feel in the emotional way um, that we do. So I'm going to turn that off. Um, we build Rachel in full 3D, so um, we can see different angles of Rachel. We can light her face um, differently, let's see, um, for different applications. Um, because she's built in 3D, not only can she be a digital human in a flat screen, you know, think your smartphone, your tablet, your computer. Um, but she can actually be deployed in an AR, VR environment. She can be deployed as a hologram. Um, so um, these, these are digital humans that we're 
you know, really are going a lot to a lot of trouble to actually make as real life as we possibly can. And I'm going to jump into a presentation which will give you some idea as to how we are putting these digital humans to work. But um, this is what I call engineer's revenge. Um, so this is a, 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 a demonstration um, that my engineers dreamed up to make me feel like a complete dick when I'm standing on stage in front of a whole bunch of people. Um, so one of the things we do when we talk to people face to face is we actually start to mirror some of their behaviours. So Rachel actually has a mirroring mode. So I'll just turn that on. So, yeah, you get the picture. So you, you get the fit, you know, you see that she actually is responding emotionally and in real time to what she's seeing. It's not a pre-recorded animation um, or a series of animated sequences. This is actual, you know, human-like emotional engagement and responsiveness. Enough of um, that. Um, um, I always feel silly when I have to... Um, I'll just, um, thank you, Rachel. If you go away now, I can get on and we can go back to something we're all more used to, which is PowerPoint. <laughs> okay. So, as, as I said before, we're not, we, we, we're not a, you know, people call us an avatar company or a digital human company. Um, we call ourselves a human computing company. Um, why? Because we live, and you guys are all from the tech industry, so you get this, we live in an era where increasingly we're going to end up spending more and more of our time talking to artificial intelligence systems, talking to robots, interacting with machines, whether it might be a self-driving car of the future. And we are going to spend you know, more and more of our day. We could end up having hundreds of interactions every day with these systems and these machines in the future. And we have this very, very simple view of the future um, and, and very positive view of the future, you know, aren't these machines going to be more helpful to us and more useful to us if they're actually more like us? And there is nothing more human-like than the human face, you know, something that we forget in today's society where, you know, um, we communicate by more and more ways other than, you know, the most human way to communicate, which is face-to-face. Uh, the, you know, so that's a really, really important form of human communication. So in our world of human computing, or the future of humanized computing, we see that machines will be more useful to us if they're more like us and they actually have a face. So literally what we're doing here is putting a face on artificial intelligence. Um, and we're making our machines more human by giving them a digital nervous system, a virtual nervous system through which they can learn from us uh, and respond to us in, in a human-like way. You know, we, we have, um, you know, the, our, our mindset. You know, if somebody told you today, maybe Carolyn did, you're going to see a digital human for the first time. You know, how many people would have felt, gee, that sounds incredibly creepy or scary? You know, I mean, most times when I speak to people, people think, well, you know, I mean, they, we come into, you know, a presentation like this with a lot of preconceived notions about, you know, how we'd never want to interact with a digital human or it's creepy or it's scary. Um, but once we see how human-like they can be and how emotionally engaging they can be, we, you know, we tend to actually start to form relationships with them. So we have a very utopian view of our future. Most of our views on robots, and digital humans are shaped by Hollywood and their science fiction movies, which happen to be very dystopian because dystopian movies, it turns out, put more bums on seats in movie theaters than feel-good movies about um, robots and you know, how they might help us out and how they might be useful to us in, in, in our futures and our communities and our societies. So we have a very, very you know, utopian view of what digital humans will do. I mean, we hear over and over again, the robots are coming, they're going to steal our jobs. Um, we don't actually believe that. You know, the sorts of things that we're deploying our digital humans to do today and the sorts of things we see them being deployed to do in the future are actually going to be jobs that we're not very good at, we don't want to do anymore, or you know, we can't afford to pay people 
um, to do them anymore. So, um, you know, we don't buy for a second that, you know, I mean, I mean, our view of the world is these are, this is technology that will have a very, very positive impact on society. So I want you to think you know, for a second about the big picture here. So I can deliver uh, an incredibly personalized customer experience. Rachel recognized me. So every time I sit in front of Rachel, Rachel is going to recognize who I am. She's going to learn about my personality, whether I'm a happy or grumpy person, whether I'm a relaxed, um, laid-back person or a terse, impatient person, so that when she you know, starts interacting with me, she will change the conversation and the type of conversation we have based on her knowledge of my personality. She will remember every single conversation we ever had. She will remember what products that you provide me that I love. She will remember which products or services you provide me that really just piss me off. Um, so she's capable of delivering an incredibly personalized customer service experience or a, a, an incredibly personalized interaction in the same way that when we sit face to face across the table with each other, it's an incredibly personalized communication experience. Um, she is also capable of delivering very, very specialized knowledge because, you know, as we learn about artificial intelligence systems, I mean, they start off by only knowing what we tell them to start with, but they continue to learn and improve and get more intelligent over time. So we sit at what we call the personalization of, personalization of customer experience, or the personalization of user experience, and the delivery of highly specialized knowledge. So stop for a second and think about that in, uh, for a banking industry. So um, well, before I give you that industry example, there's a, there's a, a rule or a, an industry rule that's emerged recently called Varian's Law. Um, anyone heard of Varian's Law? Um, Hal Varian is the chief economist of Google, and he's, re he's recorded as saying, we can predict the future by, based on or, or the, the future and the way in which we'll use technology in the future based on, the way, on, the, on what rich people have today. So, you know, so if I use my banking industry application, if you're a, a millionaire, you've sold some tech companies and, um, or you've held an important executive job and you're a multi-millionaire, your bank will provide you with a personal banker. And that personal banker will help you manage your money, invest your money, move your money, um, and provide a whole range of a very, very personalized service for you. If you're not one of that rich 1%, you have to stand in queue and wait like everybody else. So imagine a future where a bank using a, you know, digital um, customer service agents could deliver a highly personalized customer experience and specialized knowledge to every single one of its customers. Imagine that world, and that's a world we're exploring. Our first big banking customer um, is the Royal Bank of Scotland, one of the biggest banks in Europe, um, and they announced at the beginning of last week um, the, uh, the partnership and, and the work we've been working with them on for the last six months to, to start the process of you know, deploying these personalized bankers in their um, environment. So this is um, technology that is, you know, it's not the future, it's available here, it's available now, and we're actually you know, deploying it and making it work. But I, but I was talking before about you know, how you know, these digital humans can do things that we don't want to do. Um, we live in, in, in unfortunate times in this country. I mean, you know, I saw some survey last week from one of the big UK magazines or newspapers saying New Zealand is the most incredible country in the world. Um, but we have high school kids in this country who, ha who do not have access to science and technology teachers. We have communities in this country that do not have access to GPs, do not have do doctors anymore. I think we've all read in the newspaper of... I think, I think it was Manga Kino who you know, try, you know, offered $400,000 for a GP to go live there in Manga Kino, uh, and still they don't have a GP. Um, so you know, we have pe you know, kids, we have communities you know, who cannot get what we regard as pretty important services. Teachers for our high school kids, 
you know, health professionals for our communities. Um, so digital humans can potentially fill some of these roles. We're working on building a digital tutor for high school kids so that, you know, if they get stuck on a physics problem or a chemistry problem, they can have a digital tutor explain the theory um, behind that. Um, we are experimenting on digital healthcare in terms of how, you know, a digital healthcare um, professional might be able to handle some of the initial interactions which identify some of the symptoms and if somebody needs to, you know, get in an ambulance and go directly to hospital um, because, you know, because there isn't somebody there to look after them locally. These are all things that, you know, we can envisage and we are experimenting with um, at this point in time. So we live in downtown Auckland. We're on the top floor of the Ferry Building. There's a roughly about 60 of us um, at the moment. We have three, three professors. Um, yes, I think it's actually closer to 20 PhDs and two Academy Awards um, to our credit list. Um, my um, business partner, Dr. Mark Sager, um, won Academy Awards for his work on the, on the digitizing the faces in movies like Avatar with James Cameron and King Kong with... Um, with uh, uh, with Peter Jackson, so that's you know kind of uh, you know some of the pedigree in terms of you know Mark's life work in in, in the digital faces. Um, um, the technology was developed over um, between 2012, or the core technology was developed between 2012 and 2016 at the University of Auckland. We spun out of the university in July of 2016 when we took on board seven and a half million dollars of US dollars of venture funding from some of the smartest AI investors in the world. Horizon Ventures, um, which is part of the Lee Kai Shin Foundation out of Hong Kong. They were early investors in Facebook. They uh, were the spin-out investors in DeepMind, which got acquired by um, Google recently. Um, um, they are, uh, were our lead investors in Series A. They bought Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook in as a shareholder. They bought um, Demise and Mustafa, who were actually the two founders of, uh, of DeepMind, into our company as shareholders right from, from the outset. So, you know, you, you, you start to get a feel for some of the exciting things that we're doing. Personalized customer experience for global brands. Um, and, and you'll see some of the brands that we're, we're working with, some of them uh, are, 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 are local ones. Um, we believe in, in the future that we will have, each of us will have the opportunity to create a digital version of ourselves. So within five years, you know, creating one of these digital humans, you know, capturing your, your, your image, your personality and, and elements of your voice, you can, you can, you'll be able to set that up in minutes, not, you know, in the moment it takes weeks to do this sort of stuff. And you'll be able to create a digital version of yourself that will go off into the world and do stuff for you. Um, we believe that you know, the digital DNA which we're starting to create now, we have a population of eight digital humans at the moment, um, will, be, will evolve into a population of billions of digital humans in the future. And the conversations that happen every day will be like a giant, if you think about it, telecommunications network. Um, you know, for the first time, we start to build a database of all of the emotional interactions that we have. So when you think about it, you know, when we sit in a meeting, we take notes about um, um, what we heard, what we learned. Um, we take notes about action items or you know, outcomes from the meeting. Um, but where do we store the emotional stuff? You know, how we felt about the meeting. Usually... That's only in our, in our memories. You know? So imagine a world in the future where that emotional data is being captured and, being, um, and is being used in a whole bunch of, of different ways. I mean, literally, a company will know via every single interaction with a customer whether it was a positive or a negative brand interaction, for example. Um, as a company, um, you know, we, we, um, you know, we, we attract, see, it's jumping forward. We, we attract interest from the international media, the international, international press on a regular basis. Ashley Vance has followed us for a number of years, the guy who wrote Elon Musk's 
um, biography. Um, he featured us on, the, did a feature art article on us for um, Bloomberg magazine last year. Um, you, you can find most of this stuff um, online. Oh, what a day. Mark? Is that you? Wait, have you been sitting here this whole time? Hell, there's nothing else to do in this little bubble you locked me in. There's no guns, no jungles, no planes to fall out of, trains to climb up, automobiles to serve. <laughs> you know, from the game. What I'm trying to say is I am freaking bored here, man. Just help a brother out. All right, all right. What would you like to do? We could chat, catch up, talk about sports, weather. How about we play some games? All right, we got GT Sport in the tray, and your rival James just beat your record lap on the Tokyo Speedway. Ah, oh, man. Don't worry, I'll beat him later. What else have you got? Ooh, how about we jump back into Shadow of the Colossus? Yeah, awesome. All right, here we go. Okay, so um, and, and just a, I mean another interesting use case. This is a proof of concept we we did with Sony, um, reimagining the future user interface for the PlayStation. Who recognised the the character on the TV screen? Any Sony PlayStation guys here? Nathan Drake. Um, you know, so what we were doing there is you know we were bringing a PlayStation character Nathan Drake to to life in a way that he becomes the user experience the user interface for the PlayStation. So instead of having to search through menu systems for the games you want to play, you can actually have a conversation with um, with your favorite games character. Um, so I mean, you know, I, I, I often use that to, no, we, want, we, don't, we, we don't we don't want to um, see that again. So, you know, you know, we kind of come to the point where we've always imagined our computers being more human, and for the first time we start to get the opportunity to do that. And if you recognize some of those things, at least a couple of those would will date you like um, the fact that I knew who they were as well. So um, so here's, here's something that um, you know, illustrates very simply how powerful um, our face is as an emotional instrument, as a communications instrument. So here's a scene. This is a scene from Mark's favorite movie. And for a guy who's won Academy Awards, I can not quite understand why he chooses this particular movie, but he does. So um, I'm going to flick to the next slide. I'm going to make one small change here. And you're going to have to watch really, really carefully. Let's see if you can figure it out. <laughs> not so subtle, um, clearly. And you all did figure it out, so you were at least um, still awake. So that's good. Um, but what happened there was we made one s small change to it. We changed one of the faces in the scene, and it completely changed the context of the scene. It changed the way you felt about it, the way you responded to it. It changed your emotional state. You know, we went from, you know, what's he going to do to uh, um, laughter. Um, and I've actually now ruined your memories of this particular scene. So this classic love scene is now being, will be, you know, will forever scar. And every time you see the scene, you'll say, I wonder if Mr. Bean's going to pop up next. So I've actually changed your memory. So that is the power of the human face as an emotional instrument and the way in which we interact with each other. Um, and that's why we believe the human face becomes a very, very important part of the way in which we enable machines to communicate more efficiently with us going forward. How many of you have an Alexa at home? No one? How many of you use Siri in your smartphone or, or, or the Google equivalent? A few of you. Um, voice assistants um, are kind of interesting in that you know, we tend to use them for transactional type questions. What's the weather today? How long is it going to take me to get to work? Um, it's very, very different, difficult for a human being, for most human beings, to form a relationship with a voice. Um, people form relationships face to face with the human face, with the human, the ultimate human condition. So, so we're very much of a view that you know, organizations like Amazon, Apple, you know, and, and all of the people that are, are moving towards voice assistance, they're going to have to give them a face. Alexa, the next version of Alexa has got a camera in it. Why? Um, because it can, so it can read your emotional, see what's happening on your face. 
Look at your, read your emotion, read and analyze your emotional responses. How many of us actually like being watched without knowing who's watching us? Again, um, a human face becomes an important element of the world of the future. So, um, I talked a little bit before about Baby X, and um, I'm not going to go too much into this. This is our core research platform. Baby X is an autonomous digital human. Uh, Mark, you know, if you go online to our YouTube channel, you'll see Mark teaching his digital baby um, to talk, to make sounds. Um, we've recently, um, in, at the end of last year, announced Baby X5. She now has arms and legs and fingers and toes, so uh, she now has her virtual nervous system, has a whole motor control system. So Mark and I did a presentation in the brand new Abu Dhabi Louvre uh, last year, and our digital baby painted a digital picture um, in the in the Louvre uh, Museum, uh, which was a, a world first and kind of cool. Um, she can interact with the world. Um, so um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, going into that today, but I mean, you get some idea as the complexity of the models that sit behind um, what we do from from the, from this slide. Going to see an AI baby. What we're building here is a computer that can learn. She basically can see me and hear me. I'm going to hide over here. She's looking for where I've gone. It's okay, sweetheart. It's okay. Now, Mark Sager's aim is to make man socialize with machines. Welcome to Soul Machines, the world of digital humans. The next employee you recruit could be digital. I'm Sophie. What's your name? We're partnering with Soul Machines, which is an absolutely fantastic New Zealand company, to create a digital human called Sophie, who's also powered by IBM Watson. Economy Sky Couch is a row of three economy seats that turn into a couch in the sky. And the whole purpose is really to investigate, to explore the role that digital humans can play in improving the customer experience. I'm having some trouble navigating all the different options. You mean options like Sport Package, Active Blind Spot Assist, Insulated Soft Cloth Top, Insulated soft cloth top. It's a great feature that allows you to have the top up during the cooler months and not feel the cold. Is that something you'd be interested in? Yes, definitely. There's so many credit cards out there, so many offers, options. I don't really know what to do. Oh, Chantelou, I completely understand. Would you like some help? Sure. Do you mind if I ask about your credit score? Welcome to my party. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for asking. Do you have a favorite song? Oh, that's easy. Strawberry feels forever. What we love about Soul Machines is that they're really interested in understanding human consciousness and interaction and engagement. It's not my usual world, and so it's kind of quite exciting for me. Soul Machines uses neural networks to give me a virtual nervous system so I can learn and react in real time. By giving the computer the ability to have a face-to-face -face interaction is just really adding a whole new layer of enhancement of communication between people and technology. Wouldn't you rather speak to me than a faceless chatbot? Cool, so um, that's a sort of a trailer of a whole bunch of our different work. So, you know, customer service agents, sales agents. Um, we announced at Mobile World Congress this week, um, Dame LeBenz announced the partnership we're working on um, with them, where they're looking at how they reinvent um, the entire customer experience. So if you stop and think about um, the car companies, the big car companies, their world is being disrupted um, completely at the moment, um, partially by the shift from um, gasoline engines to electric vehicles, but actually because of the shift from um, a dealer um, service network to a direct customer relationship. Because if you think about the dealers that we buy our cars from, they exist because we have to go back and get our cars serviced there. As more and more of us own electric vehicles, um, the services, the level of service they require just about disappears. Electric engines are have um, so many less moving parts, so, so much more reliable than gasoline engines. So, I mean, their world is changing. Their whole their economics of their business model is changing. So they're searching for ways to actually start building personal customer relationships from um, a sales interaction point of view. So I can go to my smartphone and I can ask uh, Sarah, 
in, in, the, in Dame LeBen's case about the latest model of Mercedes-Benz. Um, they can ask me whether, you know, I can ask them questions about whether I should lease or buy the car, um, what sort of um, deal they might be able to put together for me based on my, the, my existing car and, and the existing lease um, contracts I have. Um, I can then go into a showroom floor, because most of us, you know, when we buy a new car, like to drive it first, and we can actually have a three-way conversation via a kiosk, pick up that conversation you had at home on your smartphone, you know, in a, on a kiosk, in a showroom floor, and it can become a three-way conversation between your digital salesperson and your real salesperson. And that can go all the way forward into the future to, you know, and to your, your future self-driving car where you have a digital chauffeur you're talking to. Because, you know, in the car, not just a voice assistant, but a digital chauffeur. Here's another democratization. Rich people have chauffeurs who drive them everywhere. You know, imagine a world where we can all have a personal chauffeur in our car who we can talk to. Because one of the things we often forget about, I mean, we all love the concept of self-driving cars. Well, some of us do anyway. I, I like driving myself, but call me old-fashioned. Um, um, one of the things you, you have, actually have to stop and think about is, you know, what level of trust are we going to have to build up between ourselves and that machine to, to, to allow it to drive us down the southern motorway at 100, well, no, it's not 100, 50 kilometres an hour. <laughs> um, you know, we're going to need to build up a lot of trust between a man and a machine. And the only way we build trust as human beings really is face to face. Okay, so, you know, we believe, you know, the concept of a digital chauffeur. I mean, it's something that we're you know, experimenting with and we're talking with some of the top UX designers, you know, for these big car companies that in the UX um, labs in Silicon Valley. So, um, how am I doing for time? Ten more minutes. Okay, um, well, I'll, I'll go really fast and then we can hopefully still do some questions. So, um, we are building uh, what we call um, digital DNA. At the moment, it takes us about 12 weeks to build a digital human. Now, as you saw from that um, montage clip, um, the digital humans are based on real humans. Um, Shashila Takao, you know, a professional actor, actress here in New Zealand, she appears, I think, on Filthy Rich, um, is the digital face of Autodesk now. She is Ava at Autodesk. Um, so, you know, Sh Shashila, because we've, taken her digital likeness, we've had to license her digital likeness. She earns real money, good money, by being the digital face of Autodesk, an opportunity created. Um, uh, you know, uh, as we build up more and more digital DNA, um, it'll become faster and faster to replicate any face. Um, so we're, we've built eight digital humans at the moment. There's both men and women, the different ages, different ethnicities. Um, it will mean at some point in the future, maybe three years, we'll be able to create a digital version of you literally in minutes. We don't see, we, we don't make money out of building digital faces. We make money out of bringing those digital faces to life using our virtual nervous system. Um, the concept of, you know, the EQ data bank, really, really important concept. Um, you know, as these digital humans learn from every single interaction, um, it means the service they can deliver us becomes more personalized and more specialized. Becomes really, really important that that data is treated really, really, really carefully. Um, there's a... Um, a lot of change going on, you know, fundamental change going on around data privacy laws out of the EU at the moment, um, which you know, I have no doubt will roll back some of the um, competitive positions that companies like Google and Facebook have managed to achieve because they have access to so much of our personal data. Um, we believe that, uh, I mean, a lot of this data has to be owned and controlled by the end user. Um, this data... Um, you as the end user should choose how much of this data um, that gets shared um, with, um, with the companies that you choose to interact with. Um, there should always be some level of value exchange for your level of data. But, um, you know, um, how many, there's a, there's a great book on, on, on big data, um, was written by the chief 
um, scientist of, or chief data scientist for Amazon. And, um, it's called Data for the People. Um, really, 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 really great book to understand how much data we're giving away as individuals just by continually opting in. And this is a world in which we will have to, um, this is a world where we will have to uh, um, be much more uh, aware of um, the protection of individual data going forward. Um, we are looking to grow um, the number of interactions between our D digital humans and real people as quickly as we can. So we're in the process of building a number of digital celebrities. Um, yeah, I mean, imagine being able to have a conversation with, you know, I mean, I know this is a rugby country, but um, most of the world, um, football is the biggest sport. Um, imagine um, kids being ha able to have a digital conversation with, um, you know, one of the digital superstars of the sport, a Cristiano Ronaldo or a Messi. Um, um, you know, in, in, in real life. You saw the talking strawberry there um, in that montage. Um, that's, that talking strawberry is actually, for those of you that don't have young daughters, is actually Strawberry Kiss. Strawberry Kiss is one of the characters that's part of the most, uh, of the largest toy franchise in the world, Shopkins. The Shopkins toy franchise is owned by uh, uh, an amazing Australian entrepreneur out of um, Melbourne. Um, who has a company called Moose Toys. We are literally bringing you know, some of the Shopkins characters to life so that your kids will be able to have you know, a conversation with their favourite toy. Um, and you, you as a parent will be able to buy educational content so that um, when your kid's interacting with their favourite toy, they'll also be learning. Um, so um, all sorts of benefits um, in this world of the future. So it's not just as we go about creating these digital humans, it's not just about creating the faces. We also obviously have to create the voices. Um, you know, uh, um, uh, we also have to create the personalities because they don't come with personalities like we do. Um, a digital employee has to have a personality that is fit for purpose. So when, you know, when we employ a new um, employee in our own organisations, you know, we're looking for somebody who's got the right personality for the job. I mean, somebody who's an angry person is not going to make a very good customer service per, um, agent um, or a very good customer service interface. So, I mean, we, we, you know, when we select our real employees, we look for people that are going to uphold the values of the company and have a personality that's suitable for the role that they have. So we actually have to build these personalities for these digital humans. I mean, think of it. A digital human might have different personalities. Um, the way you talk to a 50-year-old professional banker uh, to the way you talk to a 20-year-old college student, completely different if you want to engage and relate to them. So, you know, a single digital human might have multiple personalities. They certainly may need to speak multiple languages. Um, uh, so um, um, these are some of the parts and some of the processes we have to go through in, in terms of creating this. So... Um, we create this um, amazing um, opportunity to reinvent the way in which we interact and we connect with machines, transforming customer experiences, democratizing knowledge, delivering new brand experiences, and providing a completely um, different type of user interface. Um, you know, at Autodesk, so you know, these are some of the existing use cases. You know, Ava. Um, is, is the face of Auto, Auto, Autodesk. Um, she works as, uh, on top of IBM Watson and an existing chatbot implementation. The objective is for Ava to take over 70% of their Tier 1 and Tier 2 help desk calls r related to licensing and purchasing of new Autodesk products. Um, at Royal Bank of Scotland, um, and specifically with NatWest, Cora is a d digital customer service agent currently being trialled and in their, a couple of their digital branches. So, you know, at the moment she's a, um, she's a, a, a she exists in a branch kiosk and, uh, and people, in, as part of the pilot, um, customers of NatWest can come in and interact with, uh, uh, interact with Cora rather than having to wait in queue to, to talk to a, a real person. Um, eventually she'll become part of their banking application. Um, uh, and we've already talked a little bit about Sarah um, at Mercedes-Benz. Um, 
Um, these are some of the user interfaces of the future. So they're not just head and shoulders, they're going to become full body faces. So here's a, a simulation of you know, um, Cora interacting directly with me, um, and as I give her instructions, she's filling out um, you know, information on, on, the, uh, on the screen. You know, so that I, you know, it becomes a, 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 you know, a, a much more um, intuitive user interaction. I'm just going to continue to jump forward. So, as a company, um, we're, we're very much internationally focused. We have clients in Japan, we have clients in, in Germany, in the US, um, in, in Europe. Um, we have clients here, we have clients in Australia. Um, we tend to look um, very carefully for fast-moving sectors, industry sectors, where the threat of disruption is obvious. And we are working with, um, and pretty much we're only working with at the moment, visionary CEOs, visionary C-level executives who have to be the first in their industry to deploy a digital employee or a digital human. Um, you know, it, this is still I mean, relatively new technology. Um, you know, I can't stand here and say I can give you an ROI or a business case on implementing our technology. I don't know. I can guess. Um, but you know, we are working, looking to work with early adopters and people who want to be first. You know, we went from, I met, went from introducing myself to the CEO of Royal Bank of Scotland, happens to be an expat Kiwi by the name of Ross McEwen. and I went from meeting um, Ross the first time to doing a deal with his innovation team in five weeks. You know, um, one of the most incredible innovation systems in the world at that bank. Um, you know, as a bank, you know, and the RBS as a bank is much maligned because they were one of the poster childs of the, the global meltdown with, for those of you that followed it, with Fred the Shred, the previous CEO. Um, 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 you know, RBS have technology scouts in Silicon Valley. You know, a bank, you think about it, a bank has a, a group of people in Silicon Valley looking for the next things they can use to change the way in which they deliver customer service. I mean, Ross, you know, is, you know, gets that his relationship with his customers is going to be everything to him in the next 10 years. Blockchain is going to disintermediate a lot of their transaction revenues. He knows that. He has to find a way to have a personalized experience with every one of his single one of his customers. You know, we're deploying not just Cora, but we're working on um, an internal training um, use case so that um, they have a digital coach that can keep their um, salespeople up to date with the ever-changing regulatory environment in the banking industry. And we're working on a, a digital literacy application for kids so that they can get kids engaged in learning about banking and money and, uh, and, and finance at a very, very young age in a, in a very interactive way. So, you know, we really are looking for those visionary leaders who have the courage to embrace the future now for the very, very simple reason they cross a line. When you go from, you, you go from the robots are coming to the robots are here, uh, you actually have to be willing and prepared to have some pretty honest conversations. You have to be prepared to have conversations with your existing staff about how and why you're deploying digital and humans and what that might mean with you. You have to be prepared to have conversations with your customers and your stakeholders. And not everybody is brave enough to do that at this point in time. So, um, you know, so we're, I mean, I get to travel around the world. I think I've got the most fun job in the world. I can go from having meetings with corporate CEOs to some of the biggest celebrities and, and, and football stars in the world um, and talk about creating digital versions of themselves and imagining these. So here are some of the, you know, the wild and wacky things that, you know, that, you know as I say, that we're really doing. We're looking at bringing one of the grand master artists back to life. Imagine standing in... Um, one of the top museums in the world looking at one of the most important paintings in the world and having a digital version of the artist explain who painted, you know, how he painted it, why he painted it, where he painted it, um, who's owned the painting, you know, how the value of the painting has changed over time. Completely different type of storytelling. Imagine, you know, some of the icons of the world of today being able to immortalize themselves and carry their <coughs> legacy uh, and their core messages into the future. I mean, the, the technology exists now for us to be able to do that, uh, to be able to provide Hollywood superstars and, and sports stars of the world the opportunity to engage 
you know, directly with fans and invent ways to um, drive new revenues and new sponsorship opportunities. It really is a world that is driven by our creativity, our curiosity, and our imagination. Thank you very much. Absolutely fascinating presentation. Thank you so much. I'm sure there'll be like a ton of questions, um, but let's get our first hands up, Craig. So um, lip syncing seems to be hard. Why is that? Yeah, the, the lip sync here. I mean, some of the vi the video lip sync is um, challenging because of PowerPoint. So, and the way in which uh, uh, videos gets to re gets replayed um, in PowerPoint. So, um, it's, it's not you know, it's not. It's not as good as I would like it to be. My, my team c continue to convince me to move to Keynote, which apparently is better, but um, I haven't quite um, got around to that at this point in time. So, yeah. Um, um, the lip sync that we achieve in real life is good enough for lip reading. Okay, so one of the reasons we build voices ourselves, I don't particularly want to be in the voice business, but we b build voices ourselves because in order to shape the lips, you actually have to get access to the phonemes. Um, and none of the people that that um, build voices like Amazon and, and Apple um, will actually provide anyone with access to APIs at a phoneme level at the moment. So, yeah, no, um, and, and, and a, in, in real life you'll see that it's actually good enough for, for lip reading. Um, do you think reading and writing will die out? Um, no. You don't think it will displace reading and writing? Um, no, I mean, you know, convers you know, I mean, we, we see this as a much more human form of conversation and a much more personalised level of interaction. You know, no, we don't see it as replacing um, um, reading and writing any more or less than what reading and writing is is changing at the moment. No, um, we think it will augment storytelling a, a lot. Um, and we think, it, it, you know, the way in which we can teach people, the way in which we can deliver specialised knowledge um, in education. Um, you know, we're, we're building a 3D, an AR application at the moment for training of nurses. Um, you know, teaching nurses how to deliver bad news to a patient. To a patient, it's not something that you can do any other way, other than doing it in real life. So now they can do it with an emotionally responsive human. So I think it's a, it's a different way of delivering information. I think it augments the way in which we learn and communicate. Who are you competing against, Greg? Um, yeah, yeah, lots of competition um, um, from a lot of different things. I mean, I, mean, I regard chatbots um, a, a, as competition today. You know, text-based user interfaces, voice assistants are competition to us um, um, today. There are other avatar companies out there um, that use um, games packages and animation systems to bring their um, avatars to life. What's unique about our technology and what we believe makes um, what we're doing really, really important is we're the only guys in the world that have built a virtual nervous system. So, you know, so, and we think that will become incredibly fundamental in terms of making these human-like. So, yeah, there's a bunch of um, competitors out there and, um, you know, um, having built technology companies on the global sk sk stage for my whole career, the more competitors there are, um, the easier it becomes to sell great technology. Uh, just how much data is there in someone like Rachel in terms of like megabytes or gigabytes? How much is actually stored in there? Um, uh, I, mean, it, I mean, it depends on what level of data you want to store. I mean, effectively... Um, Rachel is being de um, delivered as a video stream from the cloud. So I mean, at, a, at, a, at a most fundamental level, you can record both sides of the video stream. Um, you can analyze data. So I mean, we have our own emotional analytics um, systems, which will analyze you know, um, A, the content of what's being talked about and whether Rachel was smiling or upset, you know, or the person she was speaking to was smiling or upset at the time. So we, you know, we can record that, that data and provide you know, summary data of a conversation. You know, sometimes our customers just want, you know, was, you know, how many great great customer service interactions did they have out of 100? You know, was it 98% or 5%? Um, you know, it's a, it's a world which we're still exploring with our customers at this point. But, yeah, could be an awful lot of data. Sorry. So um, where do you think you are at on the um, uncanny valley curve? 
Um, uncanny Valley is a, um, a very subjective um, uh, measure. So just so everybody knows, Uncanny Valley is a concept that was developed, I think, in the late 70s by a Japanese professor who tried to describe the, you know, why certain science fiction characters were relatable and some weren't. Um, so um, the, the theory of the Uncanny Valley is the more human-like uh, uh, a character becomes, um, the more creepy it becomes um, because it, um, it, it gets so human-like, but it's not human-like enough that we, we find it creepy. Um, 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 and the data that we have at this point in time would say we largely cross the, the concept of the uncanny valley. I mean, there will always be a percentage of people that will find a digital human creepy, just like there's a percentage of people that still don't have smartphones. Um, um, we, did a very, we did a very big trial um, last year with 10,000 people. 74% of those people in that trial um, said they were quite happy for that particular digital human to become their primary customer service interface with that organization. So, you know, from our point of view, that's a very, very high success rate um, at this point in time. And remember, I mean, because our technology is based on neural networks and biological uh, models, every time uh, we interact with a human, um, our, our digital humans learn. So they, the, the, the the, more, the human likeness is going to become exponential as conversations go from a hundred, you know, hundreds a day to thousands a day to, to millions um, a day. So, you know, you know, we believe that for most people, uh, you know, I mean, we describe it slightly differently. Most people are willing and capable of forming an, emo an emotional relationship with our digital humans. There are others out there that don't achieve that. Programmed in off days to resemble real people. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> not, not yeah, not interesting. In, interesting thing. Look, I mean, digital humans will be frustrating for some customers. There will, you know, I mean, digital humans. I mean, there is no such thing as general artificial in intelligence. They don't know everything in the, in the same way that humans do. They are not capable of solving problems in the same way that human beings do. A digital human can only serve conversational content that has been created and embedded in the AI corpus, whether it's Watson, whether it's Google, whether it's Microsoft, or any one of the Nuance or any one of, of the other AI platforms. So they can only answer questions about content they have been told about. I mean, they learn more over time. Um, so, you know, um, you know, one of the things we have to do, for example, is if, you know, we see, um, you know, somebody who's interacting with a Rachel or a Sarah, you know, getting frustrated that they're not getting the right information, you know, um, we recognize that frustration. Um, and, you know, maybe, you know, we'll program a response and say, w you know, um, you're looking frustrated. I don't seem to be able to help you. Would you like me to connect you with a real, with a real person? Or would I, what, can I make a, an appointment or a time for you to come in, into, the, in, into, our re into our retail store um, to, to, to have a face-to-face -face conversation? So, I mean, these, you know, these um, digital humans, you know, will not um, be able to answer everything for everybody. Yeah, I mean, all of, all of the emotional engagement stuff, all of the facial expression, all of the facial analysis, um, you know, all of that user interfaces from our technology, from our own proprietary technology. So we're using, I mean, Watson or Google Brain as a, if you like, a knowledge, you know, knowledge repo repository. So, I mean, the way it works, I mean, literally, we we, we all send a, a stream of a, a stream of voice data to one of the AI platforms that we'll use their speech speech to text engine. They all run a query against their knowledge corpus, select the you know, most relevant answer, and send a text stream back to us. You know, based on 
the interaction where you know we'll take that text stream, convert it to a voice stream, and inject inject the, mo the emotional content into the delivery of it. That's sort of a, the round trip, if you like. <laughs> um, um, no, I don't think Rachel wants to age, actually. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, we will, yeah, I mean, as we will build, so, I mean, it's kind of interesting. Every single one of our customers to date, you know, wants, sees their first digital employee as being um, a digital extension of their brand. You know, so they've been very, very specific about the attributes and what they want their digital person to look like. I mean, we, I mean, I often get, you know, questions about, you know, why are all your digital humans females, um, women? I um, mean, you know, why are we role typing women into customer service roles uh, in the digital world? Um, you know, we make as many digital males as we make digital females. Our customers choose who they want. Um, yeah, um, we, um, uh, let, let, uh, let me finish uh, that question first. So um, what we believe going forward, though, is, um, I mean, my belief is customers should choose who they want to interact with. You know, do I want to interact with somebody, a male or a female? Um, do I want to interact with somebody who's the same age as me or the same ethnicity as I am? Do I want to interact with somebody in English or do I want to interact with somebody in German or, 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 or Mandarin? I mean, these should all be options that should be driven by the user because ultimately what customers are trying to drive is a highly personalized customer experience. So it should be much more customer driven. Interestingly, I guess some of the stereotypes that exist in the real world get carried over to the digital world. No surprise there because you know, we, are, we are still in control. We are making those decisions. So you know, um, it's our customers, you know, the you know, big corporates and their marketing departments who are deciding what their first digital human should look like, what age they should be. I mean, Ava, who's the voice, who's the person behind, um, uh, who, Ava, who's the digital face of Autodesk, um, you know, um, she was selected because she's, um, you know, one of the reasons she was selected was she was ethnically ambiguous. You know, depending on where you come from, she might look um, um, uh, like she's got Pacific, of Pacific ethnicity. She might look, also look like she's got Hispanic ethnicity, ethnicity African American. So she's ethnically ambiguous. So I mean, these were some of the pro design processes that they specifically, you know, went through. We think it will change quite quickly, but. It is where we it is where we are today. Um, you know, uh, real Rachel is you know is an avatar en engineer in our office. She's the only person in the world who spends a big chunk of her day actually talking to herself um, on a screen. Um, um, we, we're you know we we we've we're about to kick off a, a, the first digital soap opera between digital Rachel and digital Roman called When Roman Meet Ra When Roman Met Rachel. Um, so we're experimenting with different ways to, to tell stories and market what we have. Sorry, um, the way we build them. Um, so we, um, to build a digital human today, we, we start off with a 3D scanning process, it's, you know, um, um, which we do either here in our office in Auckland or in LA. Um, uh, and, and we take literally thousands of photos from, you know, in sync and different angles. Um, recording different expressions um, um, from, from a real person. Yep, yep. So, I mean, at the moment, in every single case, we actually have to license, you know, um, sign a license agreement with a person. They get paid for, you know, we, we pay them for the use of their digital likeness. Um, you know, um, um, so, um, so we build up, you know, so we take the, all of the, all of the, that three dimensional scan and, and then we start, literally, we build up the, the face from the bone structure, the muscle st muscle structures, um, you know, all, I mean, so it's an incredible, you know, digital representation of the physiology of the, the human face. The reason we, we are able to achieve the level of human likeness that we do is, is actually based on the real physiology of the human face and the human body rather than just a, a digital caricature which is being brought to life by an animation engine. Okay, that, that is just amazing. Thank you so much.